Hello again, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of the Jack Swarbrick Show. I'm Jack Nolan. Jack Swarbrick is uh, out of town this week doing uh, university business at meetings, so uh, I'm going to slide into his chair along with uh, our co-host this year, student-athlete co-host Sam Bush, and he's brought one of his uh, teammates and position mates, Mike McGlinchey, uh, along with him this week. And, of course, Mike, I don't know if you know or not, he made his television musical debut last week and it was all over social media i don't know if you got a chance to see that or not i I certainly did and i've been seeing sam's musical talents for uh, a couple months now since he brought out the the cards in camp um definitely gave us a lot to listen to and pass the time by during those hard august days but um you know he's absolutely the most talented and most famous offensive lineman we have at the university (laughs) at this point you know i I got here and mike had the reputation for best singer on the o-line and once I heard that, it was kind of like, you know. So is Mike still the best singer in the O-line? Second. You're the best singer now as well? Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Would you agree with that? I don't know if I agree with it, but he's <laughs> definitely more musically inclined than I am for sure. Well, he could, he could do all the, the accompaniments, and you could be the singer. Yeah, we could do it. We could, we could make something work. We'll see. Duet, maybe. Come up with some kind. I mean, what a great traveling band you'd be because you could not only entertain, you could serve as the bouncers for the evening as well. <laughs> yeah, kill two birds with one stone. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Why not? Why not? I'm going to turn it on you a little bit with Mike because, you know, one of the famous movies about Notre Dame is Rudy uh, as a walk-on. But but Rudy was basically a guy who wanted to be part of the team, but let's be honest, couldn't play at this level. Uh, I think things have changed a little bit in terms of who's even allowed to walk on, and that's not just preferred walk-on. So, Mike, tell me a little bit about what Sam does in practice and how he helps you guys get better and how he helps the defense get better. Well, Sam, along with a lot of his other teammates that are all of our walk-ons, um, do a phenomenal job day in and day out working and coming to work for our football team. Um, Sam especially, he's been here for four years now and um, brings that energy every single day. Brings po- He's always positive, always ready to work. Um, and they do whatever we, we ask them to do. And, and, and it's it's not an easy job by any means it's, it, to get beat up on by, by guys that – most of the time are three times your size and, and a little bit stronger, but um, they give us different looks. They, they execute to the best of their ability of teams. They have to learn. It's the hardest job, especially for offensive linemen. You've got to learn a new offense every single week. And uh, I remember the days when I used to play scout team, and, 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 and these guys continue to do that with a smile on their face. And, and, um, and without them, we wouldn't be winning games. And, and it's, uh, it's a testament to their character and the way that they come to work and the p- type of people that they are. Um, to do all the work that they do without a lot of the glory. And, and uh, Sam is, I think, what are you titled, the king of, of the WAPU, oh, Presidente. Presidente of the WAPU Nation. Nation. Walk-on so, Players Union, shout out to my boys. Yeah, so, you know, we got a good one right here in Sam, and, and, and there's been a long line of good guys before him as well. So um, WAPU is everything to our football team, and we love him for it. Now, Sam, Mike's skill on the field is very well known, and we're going to talk about some of the numbers where it is translating this year what Mike and the entire line is doing. And I know no offensive lineman is ever going to take credit, and rightfully so, because it's, a, it's an entire unit. If one of them breaks down, it's not effective. Uh, but he's also only the 22nd two-time captain in the history of Notre Dame football. What kind of a leader is Mike? I mean, Mike is just one of those guys who comes in every day, locked in, unbelievable work ethic, and is always focused on one aspect of his game to make better every day. It's not that he comes into the building looking to make his entire game better. It's that he walks in and he's like, okay, I'm going to focus on this aspect today, and when I leave today, I'm going to be better at this than I was when I walked in. And just taking that methodical, you know, almost maniacal approach to it has paid off in dividends for the kind of performance that he's putting out on the field, but also the kind of leader that he's become because guys in the locker room see that and we see, okay, that's that's how it's done. That's the benchmark of work ethic, of grit, of being able to just go about your business and being the same guy every day. That's a huge thing that's preached in the offensive line room is coming in every day and being the same guy. And I don't know a better example of that than Mike McGlinchey. When you look at some of the numbers, after four games, the Irish offense is seventh in the country in rushing yards per game at just under 294. The offense is averaging 559 yards and just under 39 points per game perfect in red zone efficiency 19 for 19 with 17 touchdowns and already this year Notre Dame's had two 200 yard rushers in one game that's never happened in Notre Dame history you've broken the yards per carry record in a game 10.1 yards per carry at Boston College against Temple you had three rushers over 100 yards as far as we can tell that's never happened before at Notre Dame 
I mean, coming off a year where you were the first to say and you know, it didn't go the way you wanted it to, this line is getting to the point where it's starting to dominate opponents. Absolutely. And we, we've, we've had some success in the first couple of weeks of this season. And uh, it's it's because of the way that we come to work, the way that we prepare, and the, the way that our, our coaches plan our games. And um, we're very fortunate to have the people in charge of our program that we do, and, and starting from Coach Kelly to Coach Long, our offensive coordinator, and uh, obviously our, our coach and Coach Heastan on the offensive line. Um, we've had a lot of success so far, but that doesn't guarantee anything. So um, we're our goal is to be as efficient as possible day in and day out, and we got to keep getting better because even in those performances that, that have great numbers and all that, we still have things that we identify on film that we certainly need to improve on. Um, and it's just, a, it's just a battle each and every day, and that's why football is so great. You can, you can look like you're having success and have everybody telling you you're having success, but if you honestly look at yourself and look at the film, you know exactly what you need to improve on, and, and football is a game that you'll never be perfect at, and, and there's always something to take from it. There's always something to learn, and uh, our, the five or, or the six guys that we have up front um, certainly take that with a lot of responsibility, and week in and week out, we, we do our job to the best of our ability, and um, we just try and do our best job to help put points on the board for Notre Dame. Mike, I would say that I know you a little bit better than most. <clears throat> and uh, having said that, uh, you, you hold yourself to an incredibly high standard. And you, you, have a lot, you put a lot on yourself to perform the way that you think you should. And wh where does that internal drive come from? I think just the internal drive of, of wanting to, you know, help Notre Dame win football games and be the best um, offensive line that we can be. Um, personally, I've, I've been trying to chase a dream for since I was a little kid, and um, I don't want to stop until I'm the best at what I do, and, and um, even then, there's probably not going to be much of a stop either. Um, you know, like I said, football is one of those things that you're always improving on, and you can't ever be satisfied. Um, the great ones are never satisfied. There's always something to do. I've had a lot of great guys in front of me to learn from, and, and, and from starting from Zach and Chris Watt, Zach Martin and Chris Watt, from Nick Martin and Ronnie Stanley, and, and now Q and I are kind of at the forefront of our room now um, that we hope that we're kind of continuing that standard and, 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 and showing the guys in our room and especially the young guys about what it really means to be a Notre Dame offensive lineman and, and work the way that we do. And um, the internal drive just comes from wanting to be the best that I can be and, um, and obviously wanting to put on a good show and, and win for Notre Dame. We've got that big new video board in Notre Dame Stadium now, and one of the things we uh, put up there on it each game, now I know you haven't been able to see it because you're playing, but it's called Irish in the NFL. And you just uh, mentioned uh, some guys that we've already featured in that weekly feature, and you could have been one of those guys this year. You could be playing on Sundays right now. You've graduated, but you chose to come back and play at Notre Dame for another year. Why? Um, well, first, uh, it's Notre Dame. If I have an extra year, why not take it? It's the greatest place in the world, and you want to be here for as long as humanly possible. But um, in terms of a personal standpoint, I, I, I learned um, from a long time ago that you need to be honest with yourself on film. And, and, and the further that you get away from that and the further that you let other people tell you what they think or what they, or let you or build you up to be something that you're truly not, then that's when mistakes and, 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 and other bad things happen. And... Um, I was honest with myself on film. I thought I knew I had a lot left to improve on personally. Um, I wanted to become a more consistent football player and become uh, a, what what I I have seen in in the guys that are before me and become a pro. And um, I wasn't to where I wanted to be on that level yet. I want to be ready when I get there. And um, from a team standpoint, we 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 didn't do too hot last year. And and it's certainly hard to leave the school that I love and the program that I love in the state that it was in last year for sure. And you also mentioned some guys who were coached by Harry Heastand. And I know fans assume when guys are good, they just assume that's magic. They came in good. But when teams struggle, it's always the coach. Uh, and uh, some of the big names you just mentioned weren't ranked that highly when they came to Notre Dame and they went out as first-round and second-round draft picks. What does Harry Heastand mean to you? Well, he's everything to me. I mean, I, I came here as, a, as an 18-year-old kid getting recruited by Coach Eastan, and, and um, he is he's the reason that I am where I am right now as a football player. Um, and, and, the, and I'm sure those guys that came before me will tell you the same thing. Um, he's as good as they come in, in terms of um, 
offensive line coaches in 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 the country, and and, pro, and I, I would be hard pressed to find somebody better than him in the NFL too. Um, it's he's one of those guys that that just comes to work every day, and and his mentality has rubbed off on on his players. He's he's a he's as passionate as they come, as detailed as they come, and and as and wants so much for us that it, it, it makes it a lot easier to go to work and, and put up the, with the things that we put up with, knowing that he has our back at all times and he probably wants more for us than we want for ourselves. And um, he's done a great job with me. And um, obviously it's not all roses growing up through uh, the ranks in five years of playing offensive line, but um, the more that you come back to it, the more that he teaches you and the more that you grapple with what he's talking about, the, the more you realize that if you, if you listen to him, you're probably going to go and do something pretty special. I also know, in addition to just the numbers, Boston College game meant a lot to you, if for no other reason than there was a time in your life where you thought you were going to be playing at Boston College. Yeah, I, I, uh, I spent high school. Um, I went to the same – I have a little bit of a family tie to B.C. Uh, my, my Uncle John played there in, in the early 80s, right before uh, Doug Flutie. And um, then my cousin Matt Ryan went on to play at BC um, and has done some great things since. Yeah, him. he's <laughs> done some great things since he's then. A, like, he's yeah, he's kind of the MVP. But um, you know, so I had some strong ties there. And when I was a high school kid, I went to the same high school that Matt went to. Um, we grew up in a very close family, and 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 BC was my first offer. And um, when they came knocking, I it was kind of hard. It was kind of hard for me to 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 not pay attention to them. Um, but the Irish Catholic kid in me um, always waited for that golden helmet on the top of the letter and um, luckily held out long enough to get the offer when Coach Eastan got here and, and came out here on my first visit. And uh, it was everything that I ever wanted it to be and committed on the spot. Talk to me about your line mates right now because your side of the line is performing well as it was expected to. Uh, the right side of the line was supposed to be a work in progress, and I know every offensive lineman will say the line's always a work in progress. But it is. They've been running a little bit around the right side of the of the line too. Yeah, well, absolutely. We have a uh, we have a, a a great group of guys. I mean, it's hard it's hard not to. You know what I mean? We have um, not only just Q and I, but uh, everything goes through. You have to give a lot of credit to Sam Mustafer, our center, who everything that we do goes through him. Um, he's as good as they get in the, in the country in terms of of preparation, in terms of play. He's he's a, he's a phenomenal center, and and he's just going to keep getting better. And then we have Alex Bars and, 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 the, and the combo of Tommy Kramer and Rob Hainsey on the other side that have um, done a great job themselves. I mean, they've, they've gone out there and, and been able to, to execute to the best of their ability, and, and, and they've done a damn good job for us. And, and um, that was expected from us. We obviously knew what they, they were capable of as of going through spring ball and summer workouts and then fall camp, and we knew what they were going to be doing for us. And obviously coming in as the new guy, not everybody on the outside world knows what you're capable of. And if you want to deem that the weakness, that, but um, they, they don't. They don't look at it as that. They know that they have just as much of a responsibility to our offense as, as Q and I do. And uh, they've done a great job in taking it in stride. And um, I know I wasn't ready to play when I was their age, and, and the two of them have stepped up in a big way. Mike, I always enjoy talking with you, certainly enjoy watching you play. And, of course, the Irish back on the field. Kickoff 518 Saturday evening against Miami University. We'll be back to talk in depth about why we're coming to you this week from the John P. Murphy Family Team Room at Eck Baseball Stadium. But first, this time out. We represent the greatest university in the world. Let's carry that pride tonight onto this field and let's play for Notre Dame. And let's play for Our Lady. That's how we're playing today. I don't know what next week holds or the week after, three weeks down the road, but tonight, that's how we're playing this football game. It's caught beautifully. What a play. Touchdown, Notre Dame. The Irish find a way. Welcome back to the Jack Swarbrick Show. As we mentioned in our first segment, we're coming to you this week from the John P. Murphy Family Team Room here at X Stadium where the Irish play baseball. John P. Murphy's an 85 grad, played baseball for Notre Dame, went on to be very, very successful. And, Mick, I know he is a 
tremendous supporter of this program. We are joined by Mick Aoki, uh, the Irish head baseball coach, and his uh, junior outfielder, infielder, Eric Gilgenbach, who's from Rochester Hills, Michigan. But I'll start with you, Mick. What does this building mean to you in this program? Uh, I mean, I think Eric could probably speak more to what the player, what it means for our players. Um, but I, I think it's been terrific so far. I think it's a place where our guys can come and hang out. Um, the study room that we have over here is uh, Eric was using that a little bit earlier. I've seen a, a pretty steady parade of guys going in and out of there. Um, so our, our team has been able to sort of come together, have a place to really build a little community. Uh, for me, outside of just how it impacts the team, I think this is um, – you know, this is a great facility to recruit to as far as the amenities that we now have for our student athletes from the locker room, which was redone a few years ago, to this room, this sort of student athlete center. I think this is as well done as it is I've, anywhere that I've been or anywhere that I've seen. Um, and, and so from a recruiting standpoint, it really kind of puts tangible bricks and mortar into the statement of how how should we value the student athlete experience here at Notre Dame? And that's very important because you are now in a very competitive league and one that recruits uh, their tails off for the top baseball talent in the country. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, from a facility standpoint, you know, we're, we're, we're still, you know, this gets us going in the right direction. I mean, it, when you look around our conference and the facilities that a lot of these schools have, the vast majority of these schools have, they're, they're pretty. They're, you know, they're pretty shiny. They're pretty new. Um, and, you know, so I see a pretty a nice them. deal. Yeah. Uh, and, and so this, this gets us going in the right direction, gives us a little momentum. And um, I, and I think more than anything else, I was talking with somebody today. I, I, I just and again, Eric can speak more to it. But I just makes I feel like it makes our student athletes feel as though they're really valued, um, both by John and by our administration um, and the higher administration at the university who ultimately have to OK projects like these. Coach, uh, we talked about this a little on last week's show, actually, but, you know, just the brand of Notre Dame is such a powerhouse in itself, and we're talking a little bit about recruiting. You've got this unbelievable space. You've got great players on your team, but what is that brand of Notre Dame? How, how big is that in the recruiting process for a kid? I think it's a really big deal, you know. Um, you, you still have to find that niche guy, that guy who uh, high academic and, and high athletic ability and, and high character type of guys. Um, guys that I think that are very similar to Eric and, and I'm fortunate that I feel like we have a, a clubhouse full of guys that, that fit that bill, you know. Um, but those kids, I think, gravitate to places like Notre Dame and I think that this place still holds, a, a, you know, a pretty big street cred, if you will, with, with the guys about what it is that this place can provide, the opportunities it can provide, both during the, the time that they're here and then, obviously, we always talk about the, the four for 40 type of a thing. Yeah. So beyond the, beyond the time that they spend here on campus. And certainly, Eric, selling on the field and in the classroom. He's a two-time ACC academic honor roll honoree. Last year, he made the ACC all-academic team. And baseball is one of the tougher sports because you're on the road a lot. I mean, you're gone for much, if not almost all of the month of February. How do you balance that? You know, it's all about time management. You know, there's a there's a lot of travel time too. You know, where you're sitting at airports, or uh, you know, you're on a plane, or you're on the bus, and you know, you really have to take advantage of those times. Um, also, uh, you know, before games, you know, if you have a game later in the day, you have you know, the morning to get your work done. So you just have to you have to make it a priority when you can. You're coming off a pretty good year. You hit 333 last year. Five doubles, three homers, and coaches. Is Austin uh, P on the schedule again? Because he likes hitting <laughs> yeah, against yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, he did pretty. He had a pretty good weekend that weekend. Yeah, he had a home sure. run in each of the three games. So, where do you think you stand right now going into uh, this year's junior season? Um, you know, I think you know it's going to be pretty competitive. In the outfield, it's competitive. You know, the guys are pushing each other. Um, I like where I'm at. Uh, you know, I think in my mind, I'm not as worried about like who I'm going to beat out as much as, you know, just focusing on the process and being the best that I can be, and, you know, things will work out with that. You know, you, you touched on it a little bit, but obviously you had an awesome season last year. How do you come into uh, – how do you approach this season with that mentality that, okay, last year's not good enough, i, I got to be better? What's, what's going through your mind in order to get you to where you want to be in this upcoming season? Well, one thing that I try to avoid is expectations. You know, I don't really – I set goal. I try to set goals for myself, not expectations. You know, um, that's just kind of how I go about it because expectations, you know, if you don't reach them, it's, you know, it's not a good thing. 
Um, but, you know, I just focus, you know, on the day-to-day, -day, getting my work in, you know, my routines, um, and that's pretty much it, so. Now, you chose Eric to appear on the show because you like really everything, the way he carries himself, but I know one of the things you really like is his work, work ethic. Yeah, I, no doubt. I mean, I think um, I, I would think that every player in our program would say absolutely that Gilgi is one of the hardest workers in our program. I think that he's also a really team-first type of guy, um, the guy who cares about his teammates, gets to know his teammates. I think he has the respect of them for the way in which he cares about them and, and shows it, I think, pretty much on a day-by-day -day basis. Uh, I think one of the nice things about this year is that he has shown – some of that leadership that, that we will definitely need throughout the course of the year. Um, he's a guy that he has influence, right? And, and we define leadership in our program as, as people who have influence. And guys listen to him. Guys want to follow him. Um, and so, but all of that, I think, circles back to the idea that he keeps in his own house in order at, at a really high rate, right? Academically, he does really well. Um, you can share their, your GPA if you want to. <laughs> I won't do it for you. Um, but... You know, he works hard in the weight room. He works hard in the field. Um, doesn't take reps off, whether it's in batting practice, which is, you know, which is a place that it's easy to hide, right? In the outfield, you can kind of hide a little bit if you're not, but he never does. And he drives other guys to do it at that same high level. And so, um, you know, regardless of how it goes, I mean, I think I think Gilgi represents everything that we want of our players in our program. You know, Coach, uh, <clears throat> when you have a guy like Eric or like you're describing in your locker room, I can only imagine that that takes stress off you as a coach. But, you know, t talk us through a little bit, you know, what does having a guy like this in your locker room do in terms of your job? How does that make it easier for you? Well, I mean, I, you know, every program, obviously, you know, culture more and more and more has become much, so much of a, like a buzzword mm -hmm. type of a thing with, uh, as it relates with teams and, and high performance, right? But it also, you know, the other part of it is you can have a low performance culture too. Mm -hmm. And obviously you want to avoid that type of thing. And at the end of the day, I think as a coach, you try to guide it, you try to, talk to your guys about the type of culture that you want to set but ultimately it's the players who do it right the ultimately it's the players and how that goes in the locker room and I think Matt along with a number of uh, Matt uh, Gilgi along with a number of his teammates like Matt Veerling um, and you know Jake Johnson Nick Podkull I think there's a number of them that I can mention do a great job of, of continuing to keep that high performance culture in our in our locker room and um these guys, they, do, they make it a heck of a lot easier, you know, because um, at the end of it, really, really successful teams, it's the players that are driving the ship, you know, and they're the ones who ultimately are the ones who are going to determine what that culture is going to look like. And, you know, we, I have to be a steward of that, clearly. I'm not trying to absolve myself of that responsibility. But, you know, when it's all said and done, these are the guys that are going to be spending all the time with each other Baseball, like you said, is a lot of travel. It's a 56-game season. That's a lot of time spent with one another, you know, on the road, in the locker room, in the dugout, pregame, rain delays, et cetera, et cetera. And so you spend a lot of time with each other. So if you're not the type of group that can gel together and enjoys being around one another, that can really work against you. And all sports have become your own sports. You're a spring sport, but you're playing right now. You went up to East Lansing. Yep. and played a 14-inning exhibition game with Michigan State. You're playing a lot this month, and a lot of games right here in this building. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, uh, we'll scrimmage again. Um, we'll, we'll scrimmage probably, depending on the week, it'll be three times or, or four times, uh, and then we'll have either one practice or two practices in addition to those scrimmages. Um, I think that these guys are chomping at the bit to get after it and go you know, after those things. The Michigan State thing was kind of interesting um, simply because – None of our hitters had seen live pitching since probably summer ball in August, right? That's probably, mm -hmm. right? And our pitchers, uh, most of them, the ones that we threw were freshmen, and many of them were here all summer long. So they hadn't thrown a competitive pitch since you know, last May or June, depending on when their high school seasons finished. But So I, I thought we did pretty well, actually. I think our kids went out there and competed really well. and um, It was... Uh, Warm but fun day, right? Mm -hmm. I, if, it, if it's like that when we go to East Lansing in April next year, we'll be really thrilled about that, I would guess. Um, and then we got a chance to watch the football game for a little bit, so that was cool. We got to sit in 
they uh, they gave us tickets right in the middle of the student section, the Michigan State yeah. student section. <laughs> we were doing the uh, the Notre Dame push-ups for every touchdown we scored in the section too. So, so it was pretty we good. Were it yeah, to we got a couple of sideways looks, but it was pretty fun. And yeah. there. It wasn't, there wasn't a whole lot they could say. And by the end of the game, you guys are about the only ones left. You were, you were the last of the Notre Dame yeah, fans, seriously. which uh, was yeah. rather remarkable. Uh, it, Sam knows about off-season prep. He has spring football. You have fall baseball. How much? For you, the players, how much is, does this help you get ready for your season? How important is it for you? Well, I think it's a huge um, important component in the sense of team chemistry. Like, this is where we build our relationships right now to be ready for, you know, when things are maybe go a little bit sideways in the season, we can fall back on each other. Um, also, it's just a time where, you know, we get, we get stronger with our um, lifting and running. So that's a big part of it right now, too. And then guys are just, you know, maybe now is a good time for when guys can work on, you know, work on, their swings or are, are, their, are their pitching a little bit more than in season when it's like you just go with what you got. So there's that. You know, when it's, when it's this off season time, <clears throat> obviously it's, it's a huge responsibility of the leaders on the team and the guys in your role to step up and uh, be what they're supposed to be. So, you know, as kind of one of those guys who's in that situation, what are some of the challenges that you see with your team and with the guys trying to get them, trying to get them going, you know? Um, you know, sometimes sometimes we can get a little bit, you know, like today we had a run um, and we were a little quiet in it and we, you know, had to bring more more energy. Um, I think that just comes with, like, you know, that'll come with time and also just, just us preaching the same culture we've had over the years um, and the freshmen, you know, getting used to being more vocal, you know. So. I wonder if – I don't know if you guys have ever met before. Have you ever met no. before tonight? No, we have first time. Do the, the athletes on this camp – so each team has their own chemistry and their own family, but is there kind of a, a, a bigger uh, Notre Dame on-campus monogram club type of family? Yeah, yes, yes, I would say so, yeah. you know. I've, I've found so as well. Like, I know a couple guys on the baseball team. I actually went to high school with uh, Charlie Horshek. Um know some basketball guys. So I would say kind of, like you said, that bigger monogram club definitely exists because – I know people from all sports. I mean, yeah. I notice a lot of time in the stands. It doesn't matter what it is. I see athletes from all sports at all the other sports oh, yeah. very frequently. Mm -hmm. It's at least a great place to spend some time both in the fall and the spring. Yeah. I will let folks know that they can come out and see your scrimmages, and you, and you also end with a blue-gold uh, type of game that people are invited to. I do know that last season was not what you wanted it to be. It was not what you expected to be. A lot of tough losses. Uh, some things just didn't come together the way you wanted them to. How's this coming season look? I think good. It'll be it'll be interesting, right? Because uh, we lost a lot of pitching. I mean, um, you know, five guys to the draft. Uh, we lost a a catcher who off, you know, and Ryan Lidge, who um, you know had been a kind of a fixture well, back there for three years. The, you know? the pitching didn't perform as well as everyone expected it to in terms of wins and losses. Like yeah, no doubt. I mean, we got off to inexplicably got off to a really difficult start. I thought our kids did a, a, a fantastic job of bouncing back. And then as we went into the tournament, kind of setting up our some of our pitching and things like that, we lose a tough game against Florida State and extras and, you know, kind of a, a, a tight nip and tuck game against Louisville kind of got away from us in the last couple of innings, but um, in the ACC tournament. But I think going into this year, I, I like, you know, positionally we're a lot older. You know, I, I think our, our, our position players are in, in a pretty good place. I think that we have a couple of holes that we need to fill there. I think the big part is going to be how our younger pitching or our inexperienced pitching, it doesn't matter whether they're a junior or a freshman or anything in between, you know, the only guys that are coming back is Charlie's coming back with some significant innings. Scott Tully is coming back with some significant innings. But outside of that, that's, that's kind of it, right? And so... We've got some talented kids and some kids who, in the sophomore class, had an opportunity to get their feet wet and did well in certain stops. Um, you know, but, I mean, I think we were looking at a list today of the top 400 players that perfect game ranks or whatever, you know, we, we had that actually made it to campus. We have five of them, you know, and the next closest in the ACC is seven with, with Clemson. And all of that pretty much resides right in our in our pitching staff for the most part. So... It's, um, they're talented, and we'll just have to see how they make that adjustment. Well, Eric, thank you. Mick, thank you. And, folks, uh, the weather has been absurdly summer-like recently, yeah. and the uh, future forecast is seasonal at the very least. So uh, if you want to see some baseball, go on to und.com. The dates of all the scrimmages are on there, and you can come on out to Eck and 
Get yourself a little taste of fall baseball. That's going to do it for this segment from the beautiful John P. Murphy family team room here at X Stadium. We'll be back with more in a minute. We are back on the Jack Swarbrick Show. We are honored to be joined by the great Tom Gatewood, two-time All-American split end here in football at Notre Dame, played for Error. We're going to get to that in a second. It's one of the main reasons that he is here this week, because Error, who just passed away, will be honored appropriately uh, on Saturday when Notre Dame takes on Era's alma mater, not only where he starred as an athlete, but uh, began his head coaching career. But Tom, folks, has moved back to South Bend. How did that come about? A resident, a resident. Um, I guess uh, over the last three years, I've been spending a lot of time trying to decide where to retire to. Uh, gotten to that point in my career, my post-football career, where um, you've had a lot of ups, mostly ups, uh, some, some downs, but mostly on an upswing. So you start thinking about retiring and slowing down a little bit, having a little bit more fun. I've been having fun all along. Living in the New York area, New Jersey area, uh, lots of challenges, lots of excitement, lots of energy. But it was time to start looking. So after three years of looking in Florida and Texas, California, different places, and my wife then, Susan, retiring uh, from a 35-year career, we decided uh, let's go somewhere where we can have great quality of life. And started thinking about that, and we thought, college community how perfect is that and the one place i thought of was notre dame so i'm here i know after your very successful uh, football career collegiately played in the nfl for the giants then you went into sales and then i was kidding with you before most people go out of broadcasting into sales they don't go from sales into broadcasting uh, you worked for abc you started your own production company you've won emmys you've won peabody awards i mean it just it's a remarkable career and it's a somewhat unusual career path. Talk to me about how you went from football to sales into journalism. In New York, um, I was always wanting to have multi dimensions, having been under the tutelage of not only Coach Barsegan, but my parents. The blueprint they set for me was don't just pigeonhole yourself in one position. Have many, use your talents and spread them around so you don't get trapped. So for me, playing professional football wasn't enough. The off-season left me with six months of dead time. So I decided to use that education that I'd received at Notre Dame and apply it to the business field. And so my off-season job was working for a corporation. Later on, as the, I continued in with uh, the Giants, I kept staying in that same field, but I decided to start knocking on some doors, finding out if the sales pitch that I was given about the Notre Dame connection and the Notre Dame network and what there is after football came true. I knocked on the door of Rune Arledge, founder of ABC Sports, said, I want to, I want to get into television. And he said, well, what experience do you have? And I said, zero. He said, well, I know about your athletic ability. I know you're a smart guy. I think you can figure this out. I prepared an audition tape and I was hired to work the fifth game of <laughs> regional college football um, and at the same time I was working um, uh, Lynn Swan was also grooming himself to be an announcer at ABC. Um, so for me it was wow here I am, the bright lights in New York use them and be in front of the camera. So I learned that trade for three years and then I decided to go behind the scenes. So I 
joined a union, got some training, became an associate director, uh, occasionally worked as a stage manager, just getting some grassroots uh, feeling and communication to learn the trade. A lot safer behind the scenes, not in the spotlight, but behind the scenes where you're earning your cred by just performing over and over and over and over. So it, uh, it led to great success in, in television. Uh, and sometimes the security is a little stronger behind the scenes, but also anybody who does this knows that it's all those behind-the-scenes people that make the broadcast go and make the people in front of the camera look good. I mean, it, it's a lot like football. It, it's teamwork. It's, it's totally teamwork. And you do have some people who are out front, the headliners, um, but it's the, the grunt guys. It's the, the camera guys and the gaffers and the, uh, the makeup people and the, the sound guys. It all is part of the project, all part of the process. And you learn all of those pieces much the way that I did as a, as a football player, as a wideout, learning how to operate from the tight end position, how to, how to be from the X position and the Y position, how to go in motion from the backfield and get involved in the overall scheme of things. So it's and relying on those, uh, those pulling guards and those tackles and, and, and a quarterback who can throw. When you heard the, the unfortunate news, and I think it was somewhat expected, and then again, I think a lot of us thought Arrow was going to live forever. <laughs> Um, when you found out that, that he had passed, just what was that like for your thought processes? Where did your brain go? It was interesting. When I, the moving vans pulled into South Bend for me and my wife, um, uh, one of the first things I tried to do was contact Coach Barsegan, not knowing that he was ill. Uh, one of my ex-teammates, Jim Humbert, who was his son-in-law, um, I called him to find out how to, how to reach him, and he explained that he was, he was ill and was not receiving visitors at the time. So for three weeks, four weeks, we sort of, uh, you know, just waited and waited patiently, like I guess a lot of people who wanted to touch and talk and, 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 and feel era. Uh, but we were unable to do that, and unfortunately he passed. But um, I was already in South Bend, um, already a resident, um, and uh, the best I could do was just to link up with Katie and Chrissy and, you know, the family and sort of embrace them and, make them aware of how much he meant to me. Um, and I did that in writing, I did that verbally, um, and certainly participated in as many of those events as possible. You know, I, I uh, got the chance to meet Coach Parsegian briefly uh, a few years back, and just in spending the three, four minutes that I did, I could instantly tell the kind of character this man had. But what was it like as a player being around someone like that on a daily basis and having that influence in your life as a young man? I learned the lesson of what it takes to be a leader. Um, and for me, as a player, your relationship with the coach is generally, if you're confident, is give me the ball, coach. Give me the ball. But I wasn't ready to have the ball yet because in my day, freshmen didn't play varsity football. So we had to wait. It was a waiting, a waiting time, a preparation time. So his leadership leaked through, but... A leader is always preaching preparation, preparation, getting ready for the moment and then the next moment. But it takes a visionary to see the future while looking at the present. The present was a freshman football player learning the ropes, playing as basically a scout team player for the varsity. I wore number 32, O.J. Simpson, as a running back getting beat up every day, all week long in practice. I was Leroy Keyes from Purdue, another great All-American and Hall of Fame college player. Again, getting my lumps and bruises, but learning how to break some tackles, learning how to get some courage, being prepared. The visionary came when the coach recognized my ability as a runner and as a tough kid, but... I was being skilled to be a running back when my high school career was all about being a receiver. So I felt out of place. So I constantly was in the coach's face and saying, Coach, why don't you think about the you know, receiver? I want to catch the ball. Receiver, receiver, receiver. And one day he got Theismann to come over and start throwing me passes, and I was running routes and caught everything my way. And a couple of weeks later I was on the depth chart, way, way down on the depth charts to be a wide receiver. So that was the coming of Tom Gatewood. That was the let's recognize your, your skill and your talent, 
but no decisions will be made until you actually perform. So learning that talent is great, but it's not enough. It's the performance. Whether you're an employer or a coach or a husband, it's performance that makes the grade, not the talent. What did that do for your confidence as a young player to have you know, your coach and all-time legendary college football coach put his trust in you and kind of give you the keys to your own destiny and say, hey, you know, if you want to make it, you're going to have to take it, but I, I've got faith in you. It's, it's a process. Um, the first start for me, I started 32 football games with the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Ten games for three years because that's all we played. We didn't play 12. We didn't play 13. We played 10. Um, and I played in two bowl games. So it's 32 starts, 32 60-minute windows. So, wow, that's, that's, those are the minutes. Game one, I remember, one catch. About an eight-yard out against Northwestern. It sticks in my head because that was the first one. Um, when all was said and done, I caught quite a few more. But it starts with number one. And I was wondering if I was going to get any more. My number was never called the rest of the day. But that's part of the preparation. Bring him along easy. Bring him along slowly. As far as he was concerned, I'm out of position. That's my sophomore year. I got through that pretty decently. Junior year, kind of a different story. This is when another phase of that leader, that coach, that visionary, communication. He sat down with me on an individual basis and talked about a molding of me after my sophomore performance that we have a new role for you. I was nicknamed the swinging gate. You know, the swinging gate was about the swing part of it is you have a hinge on a gate. So you have a basic foundation. That's our offense. I'm on the swing. The swing is I could line up at tight end. I could flank out and be a, a wide out. I could go to the right side of the formation near the tight end and be a wing. I could be a running back starting at tailback, go in motion. The whole idea was to stretch the field to put me in a position against an opponent who was weaker than me. It, regardless of what my foot speed was or my height or weight, at some point the way he envisioned this offense centered around me in the passing game would give me an opportunity to have an edge somewhere against that defense. No matter how great their players were, there was some weak link, and we could expose them by turning me into this swinging gate that could swing from one side of the field to the other. That takes vision. Nobody was doing that. Now we talk about uh, the, the Patriots with uh, Brady throwing to the slot, the slot, the slot. I was playing slot in 1970. In 1970. That's how visionary he was. And you mentioned you played in two bowl games. What you didn't mention was it was the first bowl games for Notre Dame in 45 years. This university has always put the academic part first, and they didn't want their players playing that much longer and practicing that much longer. But it was important for the future of the program to rejoin uh, that part of college football because that's how they were deciding national championships then. How did ERA approach that, and how did he talk to you and your teammates about the significance of Notre Dame returning to postseason competition? Um, it was very... I think it was a, an easy discussion for us to absorb, mostly because it was an opportunity to move up in the rankings to be in contention for a national championship, that that was a good vehicle for Notre Dame and for our team, because that first year we had lost two games. It seems like we were 8-2, eight, 8-2, two, eight and, two, and um, uh, we had tied one. So I guess we were 8-1-1, one, and one, something like that. Um, but we were down in the rankings, and Notre Dame had prided itself on being in the top 20 all the time, year after year after year. And so we wanted to edge ourselves up, edge ourselves up, not just for the good of us, but for the good of the future, because recruiting is based on one-loss records as well. The cool part was that most of the monies that came from that game went to minority scholarships 
at the university. So it was an opportunity to extend diversity in this institution. So that gave me personal pride, being an African American. That was an opportunity that were going to be given to others the way it was being given to me. So I was excited, ecstatic that we were going, and that was the motive. Part of it was so that money wasn't really going to go to fuel our football program. It was going to the academic side. And that was the promise that Coach Barsegan made to me in almost a contract, if you will, when I was being recruited. Um, I had been recruited all across the country. And a leader is, is a person who is impactful. The impact that hit me right between the eyes was his sales pitch that was so low-key. And this is we're talking about a 15-minute meeting in the Rockney building, one of the – uh, iconic buildings that still stands on this on this campus in some little office in the basement. That's where a man of his stature was was occupied, um, and basically he said to me, "We looked at your film. It was film in those days. We looked at your film. We looked at your reels. Um, we have visited your counselors. We've talked to your teachers. We know your character. We know what potential you have." We think if you decide to come here, we can't guarantee you success. You have to work for that. But we can guarantee you an opportunity, a springboard, a platform, if you will. But you're going to have to work. So if you can give to us, our give back to you can be as many as 40, 50 years of success after football. Because you're going to get all the ingredients you'll need to go out there and win some battles. There's going to be some battles that you're going to have in life, but you're going to have the tools. I hadn't heard anything like that. When I was being recruited, all I heard was, you're going to be an All-American, you're instant success, you know, you're a great player, stroking my ego, and that really wasn't what I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear what was going to happen when it was all, all said and done. When was it over? So that, that impact that kind of leadership, and he hadn't coached me in a single down yet. So can imagine when I was playing with him, for him, what those day-to-day -day impacts were. Well, he will be honored by both his alma mater and Notre Dame. As, as we wrap this segment up, and Tom, we could talk with you for the whole hour. Maybe we should do that some week. <laughs> but what do you think his lasting impact is to this day? on this university? Oh, that is very, very tough because he's got so many things that he's given. I think sacrifice. I think a coach, every coach sacrifices their, their, their family, their, their personal desires. They give it all to those they mentor. Um, so I think, and, and the fact that that he is still with me in terms of things that he said to me. Um, in 1970, playing against Purdue, I had a groundbreaking game, probably the best game of my career, three touchdowns and 196 yards and 12 catches. And that was after one series in the third quarter. We hadn't even finished the game yet. I mean, it was like a dream game and I was pulled from the game along with Theismann and other starters and we we're on the sidelines with the coach and he he comes over and he says uh, after today and forever you belong to the Irish I will never ever forget the quote I belong to the Irish and I didn't absorb it at the time because I was still on this high from playing this, this really uh, unbelievable game and in this atmosphere it was really the coming of me because that was the, the crown jewel in a year that would lead me to become an All-American and that's the instant qualifier to become a member of the College Football Hall of Fame and the, the, the year just gained momentum and momentum and it began sinking in and later in life as the autograph seekers are still talking to me and as interviews are still happening and things are still going on and people are still talking about games that were played and statistics that I've forgotten. That kind of impact, that statement, sort of gave me that confidence. You talked earlier about the confidence. That's a confidence builder when somebody says, you are forever. 
Irish, meaning that is a legacy. I was now a part of the legacy in his eyes, and to have that blessing, that's, that'll live with me for the rest of my life, and I think that's what people felt here. So what he leaves for the, to Notre Dame is, I think, very, very, uh, very close to that. Tom, always a pleasure. And folks and youngsters who may not have seen him, those cotton balls are burned in my brain, but I have gray hair as well. Tom's records, he held every receiving record at Notre Dame, and he held them until a guy by the name of Jeff Samarja came along uh, in the 2000s when quarterbacks were throwing 40 and 50 times a game and not 20 and 25 times a game. Tom set those records when you ran a lot more than you threw. So, uh, Tom, always a pleasure. We'll have you on again. Folks, we'll be back in a minute. the Jack Swarbrick Show to wrap up this week's edition. Jack Nolan, Sam Bush, and uh, you just got to chat with a true Notre Dame legend. Uh, that's so cool. I, I, he, excuse me, I've actually met him before. He came and spoke to our team a couple years ago, but to be up close and personal and to be able to kind of, you know, have a little back and forth with a guy like Tom Gatewood. I grew up a Notre Dame fan, so I know all the names and all the figures, and that's just it's a it's a dream come true to be able to meet someone like that. And you can see the very close relationship that he had with Era Era is truly one of the, the great coaches uh, in the history of the sport, period. But I know uh, this week on social media, your musical talent certainly <laughs> got a lot of exposure. So did the dancing skills of your head coach. But I've, I've talked with a lot of the players about that today. And they basically said that was kind of indicative, really. It's a relationship that he has with this team that outsiders don't really realize. You know, a lot of people think of Coach Kelly and they think of a a different type of Coach Kelly than we get to see on a daily basis. And for the public to be able to see that side of him that we have gotten to see this entire season, it's really great because he has really – embraced his role as one of us and it's it's incredible to have a coach who cares so much that he comes in and he's just so amped up after a big win first thing he does is start dancing it's it's an unbelievable feeling to know that we've got that kind of support from our coach and that he's right there along right there on the ride with us so the irish back on the field again saturday evening against miami university by the way if you want a different sport hockey plays at 505 at Compton against the U.S. National Developmental Team. Jack will be back next week. Until then, for Sam Bush, I'm Jack Nolan. Thanks for listening, everybody, and go Irish.